Hi there, everybody. Welcome back to Leading Our Own Way. We're up to part three of this week's episode of the show. We're diving even deeper into our conversation with this week's guest. Let's continue exploring their inspiring journey. If you've missed part one and two, definitely go back and catch up. Also, if you're not subscribing, please, please subscribe. Enjoy the rest of the show. See you soon. We came home from school one day and my stepmother and my stepsister were gone. And so was about three quarters of our furniture and belongings. The house was almost empty. So she left him. She left all of us in the middle of the school day. And I'll never forget the feeling of coming into that house and, and there just being empty rooms and empty spaces and empty things. And I didn't know what was going on. And I, I, I never fully understood exactly what had happened till years later. She, yeah, she had walked out and she had immediately gone to stay with her dad. And then immediately after that moved in with our dentist who she'd been having an affair with. Oh. This is all in the same small town. And so, you know, my sister and I, wounded as we were, struggling as we were, were suddenly in this giant house with my dad, who now was drinking all day, every day, and no parental guidance. He would disappear, be gone. We would come and go as we pleased. We really had no, we just didn't have any parents. And how old were you at this point? I was, let me make sure I'm correct about this. I want to say I was 16, 16. Yeah. Uh, easy to find your fix somewhere else, isn't it? At 16, whether it's on the streets, whether it's other mechanisms to help you feel connected and, and belonged somewhere yeah. else. Right? I, I went and spent a lot of times with friends. I remember this mm -hmm. one friend in particular who I'd come become close to. She had a, she had what looked to me like a magical, perfect family. And she had three sisters. She had two sisters and the mom and dad and they lived in a great house with a pool and all these things. And, and they were Catholic and they just seemed so together and so loving and so structured. And I craved being with them. I craved being with anyone who felt like a real family to me because I just had nothing. And, and it was, you know, I don't know how to say it. It was just a really dark period, you know. I put myself in situations where I'm surprised I came out of it alive. I did things. I'd stay out all night. I'd steal checks from my dad and skip school and leave town with people I barely knew. And I just was trying to escape my life through any means possible. With these actions you were, these, the, this journey you'd taken, was this how, um, God, I always feel icky asking these questions. No, it's okay. Go ahead. So I apologize. But is this situation is how you end up, in a position to being being raped by these guys and the student and the older guy? I think it was the, 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 the belief I had about myself. Yes, the belief I had about myself. Well, first of all, the belief I had about the world was it's not safe, so whatever. And yeah. about myself was that I didn't, no one had ever taught me the word no. No one had ever taught me what a boundary was. Everyone, I mean, a lot of people had violated my boundaries at this point to such a degree that I didn't even under, I didn't understand that it, that I even had an option to say no. Hmm. I didn't get that I had a choice. What I, what I felt at that time in my life is that whatever happens to me happens to me. Yeah. And that's it. And no one's going to save me and no one's going to protect me. And I remember a couple of different incidences where I was like, I know this isn't safe, but fuck it. Why? Who cares? I don't even care if I lived or died some days. You know, understand that I was really deeply depressed and I had developed multiple eating disorders at this point. I, I, yeah, I mean, I got blackout drunk some nights just to pretend that I wasn't me. Yeah. Like, it's like, in a way, it's kind of like slowing down tomorrow appearing, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And I remember the night that I, I remember one night when I snuck out with a girlfriend, we stayed out all night. I just didn't want to be in that house. I did not want to be with that man. I did not want to be with my drunk father who one day came home after work and I had come home from school with what I'm sure was probably the flu and I was desperately ill and terrified because I was really sick and he came home and pulled me out of the bed and was shaking me and screaming at me that I was on drugs. Like I did, he was so unsafe. 
everything but was unsafe. You know, was he doing that because he didn't want you on drugs? I don't think that was it. He accused me of all kinds of things. Hmm. My dad, as his alcoholism continued and increased, he became very paranoid and very accusatory. As my stepmother had been with us, she would constantly accuse us of lying and shame us and belittle us and put us into situations where we felt, you know, this big. And I think he took cue from that and continued yeah. some of that and understand I don't remember very much after she left. I don't remember many times that he wasn't drunk. Um, I'm, yeah. I'm not defending your dad here at all, but he, he was just, he's probably used to her. He's understanding that he, he's just learned that his partner has been lying to him and having an affair. Yeah. So he's feeling, uh, what's the word betrayed, I suppose, by somebody. Yeah. Maybe. And he definitely turned his anger toward my sister and I. Yeah, he yeah, absolutely yeah. did. He absolutely yeah. did. And I, you know, I, I appreciate what you just said, because the truth is I forgive my dad. My yeah. dad was wounded in ways that I will never understand. And while I would keep him as far away from me as possible, if he were here, I do understand that he was, he was, he was acting out his own wounds. He was trying to escape his own pain and God, it must've been intense for him to do the things that he did. And I, 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 I witnessed that as an adult and I, and I see that and I'm, I'm sorry that he had the pain that he had. Yeah. I suffered because of it and that's yeah. not okay. No, but I do, I not. do understand the genesis of it. I do understand generational trauma pretty well at this point. Was he on drugs himself? Do you think? Yes, absolutely. Um, I will, I will go ahead and jump into what happened shortly after she had left. So Ooh, um, things got to be too much. Uh, I will say that we had that big house and my dad had his business and all of these things. And she was buying all the stuff. We didn't have the money. We did not have the money. They went into major debt. Um, and we lost the house and my dad moved in to apartment and he sent us back to live with my grandparents, his parents who had since moved to Georgia to be near us and who lived in an apartment. So for the rest of high school, I was in a, a little apartment with my grandparents while my dad um, lived a bachelor life and did the things that he did. And we saw him occasionally and he was very often drunk and incoherent. And then he moved in with us oh, into the I... apartment and this was a period during my junior and senior year of high school where I barely slept because most nights I would stay awake to make sure my dad didn't come home and do something stupid or wake up my grandparents or hurt us because at this point he was drinking enough where there were nights when he would come home so drunk he would threaten to kill us and stab us with a knife and so I would take the knives and put them in the closet in my room and I would lock, you know, everything up. And then I would go sit in the living room and wait for him to come in at whatever hour he came in and, and try to just kind of manage him, whatever condition he was in. And so, yeah, go ahead. And this is a guy that's never hurt you as well at this point, right? Physically, I mean, physically, no, emotionally, absolutely. I mean, yeah. you know, verbally, yeah, absolutely. But Not just threatening to kill you. Yeah. What he did, um, on one instance in particular, my dad had a weird fixation with me. He vilified my sister and he pedestalized me at the same time that he was really abusive and inappropriate with me. And there was a day when I was in school and he was at the apartment with us and I was in my bedroom and I was doing changing clothes, doing something. And I always kept my door shut. I stayed in my room a lot, you know, with the door closed because I just wanted to escape. And all of a sudden I felt this weird feeling that I'd had before. And I remember I had my pants down, I was pulling them up, and I looked up and my door was cracked about that much. Oh, my God. And I saw my dad standing there staring at me. Fuck. And then the door slowly, I said, Daddy? And the door slowly shut. Fucking and I creepy. remember in that moment thinking, God damn, I'm really not safe here. I'm really, I'm really not safe here. And so... I constantly felt on guard with him. I constantly was side-eyeing him and constantly waiting for the next thing to happen. And it did. Oh. Um, he, he seemed to get his shit together for a period of time. And he decided to buy a pizza place in town, which was not that far from the apartment. 
and it was called Upper Crust Pizza, and it kind of gave me some popularity and some cred at school because my friends would go hang out there, and you know sometimes I'd get free pizza, and so oh, you know I had a little had a little bit of agency in like you know getting people to be friends with me because it was very hard for me to to have friendships. I was I didn't fit into any group, and um, and so for just a little while, to me it was the coolest thing ever, and things seem to be like, okay, this is really cool. He seems okay. He's not as drunk anymore lately. He's got this restaurant. Maybe, if they, maybe everything's going to be okay. Maybe it's, maybe, maybe it's going to be okay. And then I came home from school one day and my grandmother was there and she said, your dad's in jail. He was arrested today. And what had happened was my dad had been dealing drugs through the restaurant. He'd been dealing drugs to my high school friends. He'd been dealing drugs to all kinds of people. And when I say drugs, I don't mean pot. I mean cocaine, a lot of cocaine. And I had remembered him getting invited with friends to go fishing and to go on the boat and to, to go to Mexico all in this very short period of time. And I just thought, wow, he's really He's really living his life. You know, I just, it's so funny because after having been through so much, I was still kind of naive and I wanted to believe the best. I always wanted to believe the best until I couldn't anymore. And basically he had been going down to Mexico. He'd been shipping in co cocaine and leading this drug ring. And our, come to find out our family had been being watched for months, our phones tapped, all kinds of stuff. And it all came out within, within 24 hours, this small town, everyone knew. Everyone knew. And I, I... I was going to ask how... Sorry. Yeah, uh, no, I was please. going to ask how Upper Crust was um, paid for from somebody who was not I doing very a, well to all of us on getting a business. Because I don't think I could just go and buy a business. Of course. Right now. I know for a fact that my dad got into, got into bed with some very shady, dark people. And they financed some things that were happening. He, was, he had partnerships. And I know this because things that happened later it was very clear at the time. It just, I just didn't comprehend what was happening. Um, anyway, so he, within about 24 hours, everyone knew. I remember going to school the next day and I felt so much shame and so much overwhelm. And I realized within days, certain people were no longer allowed to talk to me. Certain people were no longer allowed to be my friend. Um, I was pariah. And you know, at this time I was in 11th grade, my sister was in 12th and she was soon to graduate and she was going to be out of school. But for me, I, it was just everywhere. It was all over me. Everyone talked about it. It was, it was the thing everyone talked about. And I think some people pitied me. Some people were yeah. disgusted by me. Many people made horrid assumptions about suddenly who I was. I was a whore and a slut and the daughter of a drug dealer. Um, the principal of the high school, I remember, called me and my sister into his office. Maybe it was just me. I'm not sure. I do remember it like yesterday, though, because I thought, oh, gosh, good. Okay, he's going to tell me he's going to watch out for me or that, you know, things are going to be okay. Yeah. And instead, he said, I want you to know I know what happened. I know about your dad. And I'm real sorry that happened. And I'm also got my eye on you. I'm going to be watching you. So he did whatever the other people were doing is he just put us into a category of bad. And so I no longer felt safe at school in that way. I just was like, what? I'm not a criminal. I, I didn't do anything, you know, and within a short time, my dad was, was convicted. He had been sleeping with one of my classmates. He had been dealing drugs to my classmates and he was sent to the Atlanta penitentiary. Did he when get in I trouble for that bit as well, the underage again? sex? Did he get in trouble for the underage sex? I don't think that was something that they prosecuted him for, funnily enough. Hmm. Fuck. Um, it was the massive amounts of cocaine that he was distributing to all manner of people, both young and old. So we're, we're talking millions of dollars here. I don't actually know that figure. I don't actually know that for sure. I can't say. But yeah. I will tell you probably it was quite a damn lot because at one point – I don't want to jump ahead of the schedule here, but at one point when my dad had been released from prison and continued to deal, he showed up at my grandparents' apartment one day with a brick of cocaine that was like, it was massive. 
How long was he in jail for? He spent, he, <laughs> oh man, white men in America, he spent one year in jail. Fuck you know. Yeah, he deserved to spend many, many years, and I was quite disappointed that he got out. Yeah. Um, and I will Jesus. tell you that from the time he was, from the time he was sentenced and went into prison until the year and change after when he was released, he went from having black hair to having white hair. He aged considerably, and mm -hmm. I don't exactly understand why they let him go, but they put him on probation, and they released him. And he continued doing his own, doing the behavior that he had before he went in there. And he continued doing it in different ways. And that, you know, once he got out of prison, the day he got out of prison, I was there at home at the apartment waiting to see him. I had been visiting him with my grandparents on the weekends, every couple of weeks through school. It was a fucking freaky show where I'd have to go to this Atlanta penitentiary and go through multiple gates of security and to sit there with him in a, in a big room full of other prisoners you know, just to give you a little bit more about my dad and the inappropriate nature in which he handled me as his daughter, he gave a fellow inmate my address. What? So that he could write me letters. Why? Seemed to think it was a good idea. He said the guy was very nice and he was an artist and wanted to show me his artwork. Fuck. Can you, can you fucking imagine? No. So the day he got out of prison, you know, I had mixed feelings about seeing him. But I wanted to see him this whole time. I'm still trying to, you know, love my dad, even though he's this horrible person. Of course. And, and he came in, and I remember I was excited because I knew he would want to cook because my dad was a really good cook. And so he and I were alone in the, in the apartment. My grandparents were working at their liquor store. I don't know if I've said that, but they had a liquor store, funnily enough. <laughs> and he and I were having a conversation, and I was standing in the living room, and I was watching him, and his back was toward me, and he was cutting peppers because he was cooking. I knew that was going to happen. And all of a sudden we were just having a conversation and he turned around and he looked at me with this wild look on his face and he started making this weird sound. And I was like, what are you doing? What are you? And he just kind of was rolling toward me, like kind of coming, stumbling toward me and he fell on the ground and he started having what I now know was a grand mal seizure <gasps> and just spitting out peppers and vomiting and just this intense thing was happening and I'm just screaming. I don't know what to do. Yeah. And I called my granddad. I didn't even know to call 911. You know, I called my granddad and he said to, to call 911 and he was coming home. And so he came home and, um, my dad had been doing drugs in prison. He was, he was coming off of whatever drugs he'd been doing in prison because apparently it's just as easy to get drugs inside as it is out. So, <laughs> so the seizure was caused from the drug taking. Yeah. Was caused from him coming off of whatever drugs he'd been on. His body's and, just just accepting it as normal baseline, isn't it? Yeah, and and that really precipitated a many year decline. So I was around seventeen at this point, and that journey went until I was twenty seven, twenty eight, and he died. There was a ten year period where. He went to jail over and over. He went in rehab over and over. He nearly died multiple, multiple times. I came home, uh, came to see him one day. He was beaten beyond recognition. Uh, I knew he was doing massive amounts of drugs because he was very skinny. His hair was falling out. Um, his behavior was just erratic and all over the place. And this, the constant thing was, you know, how's daddy? What's going on with daddy? You know. I, I want, I want to, I want to come to you, but before I do, because this obviously, has, I want to go on how it affected you personally, and the darkness. You probably, I mean, I can't imagine how you would just be normal from this, um, and your behaviours and stuff. But before we do, you did say something else months ago, which I think is quite pivotal, and it connects with the guns. Um, you told me that he shot himself. Yes. He did. He, um, okay. So after, while we were all living in the apartment together, um, my dad had gotten into trouble. He'd broken his parole and he was going to court and very likely back to prison. And oh, the day sense. before his court date, I was not home. Thank God. He, I mean, I want you to appreciate this because I think I mentioned my mother was in the bathtub. Right? Mm -hmm, you did. My dad crawled into the bathtub 
and took one of his pistols and shot himself in the heart. So he was yeah. intending to kill himself. Oh, absolutely. fucking lutely He wrote a suicide note that was completely devoid of emotion, absolutely clinical. He knew he was going to kill himself. He knew he was going to die. He gave very specific instructions about what he wanted. He made no apologies, shared no love, and had every intention of succeeding, only he didn't. He missed like an art, whatever valve or artery, whatever it was, it was like a quarter of an inch off from having successfully killed him. And instead, he was in the hospital. I should say at this point that I want to make sure I'm being like on the timeline a little bit. So at this point, I was I had graduated from school. I had moved out of my hometown to the city. I moved to Atlanta, and I was in college. I had taken two jobs. I worked around the clock and went to school full time and was supporting myself. I had escaped my hometown, and I was trying to escape him. He would call me all the time drunk, and then the phone call I got was one night on a school night from my grandmother that he had shot himself. And they weren't sure that he was going to live at this point. And so I, I basically dropped out of school and raced home um, to see him and to help because I felt like it was my job. It had been my job. Why wasn't it still my job? I felt terrible guilt for my grandparents and like it was my, my duty to, to be the one. And so I quit my job, quit, dropped out of school, took a leave and went back to Gainesville and helped nurse him back to health. And he was so depressed when he finally woke up and realized that he had not succeeded and he was still alive, that he wouldn't speak for weeks I always talk about, and I say it on the podcast, there's this movie uh, when Harry met Sally and there's this scene in it when Billy Crystal is saying he's feeling low and he's like, I think I'm just going to moan. And he's doing this thing where he's like, uh, uh. my dad did that for weeks until finally he spoke. And I felt this desperate because he had lived. I thought, well, maybe this is his wake up call. This will be it. This will be the thing, you know, and if I'm here with him and I love him and I help him, Maybe this will save him and he can realize that he's got life to live and, and a life worth living. And so I spent this time caring for him and trying to cheer him up. And there's, I've, I've made a big leap. You know, I was in art school and I'd made this brave move to the city and I was mm -hmm. working myself to death, making it work. And I was doing well in school and I was, I was a star in my class. I was studying art and illustration and I was a couple of teachers wanted to buy my work. And it was like, I had developed this style and I was feeling like, Oh my God, for the first time I felt like individual and unique. And it was around that time that I decided to go by my middle name, Kyle. I had gone by Melissa my whole life. That little girl in the photo is Melissa. Yeah. And I remember I was in such a joyful place and I was sitting at the fireplace in our apartment that I had with my two roommates who were in the same school. And I was drawing this piece of art and it said, kiss my art. And it was me. And it had all these little creatures and things around it. And it was, I was just so happy. And the phone rang. And then that was my grandmother saying I had to come home. And so when I was back with my dad out of desperation, because he had artistic gifts, I, I, I wanted him to start doing art because I thought, you know, maybe that'll help. And so I taught him this style that I had developed. It was watercolor and pencil, and it was just a certain technique. And I taught it to him, and it did exactly what I hoped it would do. And it gave him something to brighten up about, and he, he started drawing. And it was part of the medicine that had him find purpose again. And um, he took it and he ran with it. And Amazing. I gave it to him, and I never did it again. So I forfeited my own truth as an artist and my own natural way of doing, of creating. I gave it to my dad, and that caused a whole different kind of wound in me. But it, it, for him, it gave him this drive. And I would love to say that the story ended with him becoming an amazing, amazing artist and, and, and being an awesome dad, but that's not what happened. It only worked for a little while. So how long, how well, for two questions, how long did it work for and how long, because you've already mentioned that he passed 
uh, when you were 28, uh, which was around 1997, I believe. How long from after shooting himself, how long did he live after that period? Yeah, um, sorry, I, I missed a little bit. Um, so he, the artwork worked for a while. He became obsessive. He would obsessively draw and paint. My grandparents gave him a job at their liquor store, a drug oh, addict, no. an alcoholic. Oh, yeah. That's and, why it didn't work, right? I mean, it's just unbelievable. So he would sit there at the liquor store all day and draw and paint. And it became clear pretty soon that he was up to no good again because he started getting into trouble. This was in mm. the period of time when he got beaten really badly. And anyway, uh, okay. all these things were happening and he was just in and it just, it, it didn't help. He did the art, but it, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what happened. He was doing really interesting, beautiful work. And then one day I remember coming home for the weekend and he had, at this point he had gotten his own apartment. He was living in a shitty little apartment on the other side of town. And I came home from, I had gone back to art school at this point. Sorry, there's so much. I'd gone back to school at this point and I came home to visit for the weekend and I went to his apartment unannounced and he wasn't there. And it was a train wreck of a place. It was filthy. There was food everywhere. There was, sh it was just flies. It was no, no good. And there was this piece of glass on the coffee table. And I knew at that point that things was, were never going to be okay because he had apparently in some sort of drunken or drug stupor made art on it and he'd taken these candies and he glued them on it and then he'd sprayed, you know, dripped this kind of paint and you could tell it was someone thinking they were making art and it looked like the art of an insane person. And I remember just backing out of the apartment and going, holy fuck. And from that day forward, I knew that it was just a matter of time and it was years. It was years of the same thing kind of repeating itself over and over of him almost dying, him going to jail temporarily, of him having, you know, I would come home for the weekend and try to help my grandparents because he would be going off drugs and he'd be in detox and he would look at me and not know who I was and punch me in the stomach and, you know, scream at me and tell me about his daughter and see people who weren't there. And I mean, this went on, it was a cycle over and over and over. I had no peace. My grandparents had no peace. It was constant. And I kind of wished he would die at some point because it became, I had no life. I couldn't live my life. And, um, how old are yeah. you at this point? I was in my twenties. I was living in Atlanta. So I graduated from art school I was doing great over here and I just want to acknowledge myself because at the time I was just trying to survive. But I look back and I think, damn girl, yeah, I graduated fuck. with a 4.0. I got a job the night of graduation. I was, I got my own apartment. I, I was kicking ass and also having this incredibly toxic thing, just kind of suffocating me. And, um, because things were so crazy with my dad, because it just would not slow down. I eventually was like, I have to get out of here. I have to leave. I can't live here. And I, I went to Los Angeles because it was the farthest place I could possibly go where there were some weirdos and I wouldn't be the weirdo. Join us tomorrow to hear more from today's incredible guests and learn valuable insights to help you lead your own way. Don't forget to subscribe. We'll see you then.